see where I was going to go this morning and uh, found the Celebration Hall, but all week it kept coming to me, Freedom Hall, Freedom Hall, and I kept thinking, well, you know, if we really celebrate the Lord, if we really celebrate who He is in, through, and as us, then we'll experience that freedom. How many know you are celebration this morning? You are freedom this morning. Amen. All right? So I'm just really looking forward to having an awesome time as we meet. I'm not sure how often we're going to meet at the beginning, but I'm sure that that uh, will come in time. But I just want to welcome you all and greet you in the name of the Lord. And we have been meeting at the Johnsons on Wednesday evening at 7 o'clock. I have been doing a series of teachings on the book of Revelation. But this morning I want to deviate from that series and I want us to talk about 2014. Is that all right? Right. I have, I don't know how many of you that are Facebook friends with me, but I have been putting posts on Facebook and I want to read several of those this morning and talk about them. My daughter called me up one day when we were all snowed in and she said, you are the busiest snowed in person I know. Uh, I'm working on several books right now to uh, publish and uh, I was busy putting on some posts for 2014 and so that's what I want to talk about this morning. The realization that a people need to have as we enter into this new year. How many know that Every time a new year is ushered in, uh, and preachers are the worst at this, uh, they'll try to get a little something that rhymes about 2014. And, uh, you know, you have to have a rhyme in there. And so I, I, I noticed that there were several that were posted. Listen to these. And I don't advocate these. I'm just, you know, they're just kind of funny. So I thought we'd kind of start with a, a few little laughs this morning. But uh, one went like this, don't be mean in 2014. Don't be mean in 2014. God won't let your pockets go lean in 2014. The Lord's going to bust the devil's spleen in 2014. How many know he already busted the devil's spleen? Lord, 
as we have never experienced him before. Yes. So I started off like this. Our realization for 2014 must be, I hang on to your seats. <laughs> there is only God and nothing else. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Someone says, how can you say that? Because everything that we see that exists out there, according to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 17, is a no thing. How many know that God, and he's been blamed for a lot of things that he has not done. He is not responsible for sin, sickness, poverty, or death. He sustains and he maintains and he upholds his kingdom. And he's always ising. He's always ising within us. And all we have to do is have that realization, come into that realization of our oneness in him. And as we do, we'll begin to experience him like we've never experienced him before. So here's the realization. Let's start here. There is only God and nothing else. Anything else that appears as negative out there, that Adam released upon mankind when he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is a no thing. In fact, Isaiah goes further than that in Isaiah 14. He says, it is even less than nothing. It has no power whatsoever. Has no power whatsoever. How can I say that? Because Jesus stripped it of its power at the cross of Calvary. There's nothing that is perpetuating. Now, I use the example many times, and, and I'll probably mess up my whole message this morning by going ahead and doing this. But I have written on this ball, sin, poverty, death, sickness. And to give you the illustration of how there is nothing that is perpetuating sin, sickness, death, and poverty, let me roll this ball and give you a little illustration. If I roll this ball... Uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't mean to get hurt. If I roll that ball, notice what happens. It comes to a complete stop. There's nothing perpetuating it unless I go over to it and give it some force, some power. Oh, that's good right there. See, that's what Jesus did to sin, sickness, death, and poverty at the cross of Calvary. There is nothing perpetuating that law. There's a law called Newton's Law of Motion. It was Galileo's uh, law of inertia. And what it means is that something, to keep something rolling and moving, there's got to be an external force or power to keep it rolling. Now, I can come from the external, from the outside, and give it a little push, and it will begin to roll. Now, this is what we have done because we've not really fully understood what Jesus accomplished at the cross of Calvary. We kept the ball rolling where sin and sickness and death and poverty is concerned. God, that's good. Nothing in and itself has any power except the power that we would give it. That's it, right there. How can I say that? Because Jesus stripped for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. He destroyed all that Adam released upon mankind when he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Jesus took it to the cross and he rendered it completely and totally powerless. Thank God. And we can rejoice in that this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now let me just say this. There is nothing about our life that needs to change. When you realize that there is only God and nothing else, there is nothing that needs to change, there is only something that needs to be realized. And as we realize it, then we begin to experience. Now let me start by reading a Facebook post that I put on just a few days ago. And as I read this, I'm going to comment concerning it. But listen to this. The difference between seeking a manifestation, how many know, and, and listen, I don't criticize anyone because each and every one of us have experienced the outer court dimension. Yeah. We've experienced the holy place, the gift realm. We've all experienced that. But what I'm talking about is something deeper, something broader, and something much higher. Yes. Yes. See, Paul called the gift realm the in part realm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not throwing the gifts of the Spirit out the window. There are people that still need that, and we still operate as the Spirit leads us. Mm -hmm. But when you became a believer, you were placed at the finish line. Yes, we were. Mm -hmm. You are complete in Him. You lack nothing. You are one in Him. He is all in all in all you all. Yes. <laughs> so now what we do is we come out to the outer court when we experience 
salvation. We become a believer. We experience the two pieces of furniture that were out here, which was the brazen altar and the brazen labor. Being brass, it represents Jesus' judgment was our judgment. So we came out there, and we experienced that, and immediately when we became a believer, we were set at the finish line. We're completed in Him. We're finished in Him. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness. We lack nothing this morning. And then we progress on, and we, ex now remember, we're still seated in the Holy of Holies. We progress on to the holy place, and there we experience the golden candelabra, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We experience the golden altar of incense. We begin to eat bread and wine off of that golden altar of incense. We experience praise and worship and ministry and prayer. And then right before was the golden altar of incense. Right before the veil was that golden altar of incense. The table of showbread was to the right hand side. That's where we ate the bread and the wine. Excuse me. But the prayer and the praise and the worship and the ministry was right before the veil leading into the Holy of Holies. That's good. Now, what I teach, and, and this is a little bit of a difference between the realm that used to be called the faith realm. Mm -hmm. This is not the faith realm packaged in a new package. This is a message that you can get gripped by that will cause you to experience living out of the most holy or living from the inside out. Yep. How many want that? Yes. You want to live from the inside out. We yes. must learn to live from the inside out. And that's what this message is about. Now, in the outer court, in the holy place dimension, we many times were seeking for healing, seeking for a manifestation. How many know this morning? You are manifestly declared already to be the epistle of Christ. Yep. We are the manifestation of the Father in the earth. Yes. So I don't need to seek for a healing. <clears throat> I don't need to seek for a manifestation. I don't need to seek anything. When I come to the realization he's already blessed me with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies, he's already given me all things that pertain to life and godliness, all I have to do is walk in the realization of that and then I'll begin to experience it. You know, you can turn your television on today and you hear a lot of preachers talking about uh, wealth transfer. Anyone recently hear anyone talk about that? Well, there was a wealth transfer when Israel came out of Egypt. They came out with riches, silver and gold. There was a wealth transfer. Joseph experienced that. Abraham experienced that. But that is not New Covenant. Why do we need a wealth transfer when we have it all already? Yes. When he who was rich became poor that we might be made rich. Why do we need to seek for healing? Why do we need to seek for anything when we are that? We are that. We are one in him. So let me continue to read on this post. The difference between seeking for a manifestation and living out realization is the fruit. In seeking for a manifestation, we are seeking to change something rather than realize we already are the healed. We already are everything that we're seeking for. In seeking for a manifestation, we are trying to change something like, for example, a sick body into a well body. And, of course, that has worked. Listen, that has worked. But the fruit of that, and here's the key, the fruit of that has not been lasting. It has been fruit that has been here today and gone tomorrow. You know, even those that were healed under the ministry of Jesus got sick again. Those that raised from the dead turned around and died again. Listen, there is a people. Romans chapter 8 says that the whole creation is looking for the manifestation of the sons of God that they might be delivered into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. So you see, creation is on tiptoe looking for a people that have remaining fruit or fruit that remains rather than being one way one day and another way another day. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to show you how you can experience that as we gather together and we begin to minister the word of the Lord. I'm going to show you how you can experience fruit that remains. And it is so simple we have totally missed it. You know, there's such a thing as rest. Rest in what Jesus has accomplished, rest in what he has finished, rather than toiling and spinning and struggling and fighting and decreeing and commanding. 
Now, all of that, like I said, in the past it worked, but it did not yield fruit that remains. So as we begin to come into the realization of who he is in, through, and as us, then we are going to begin to experience the fruit that remains, and people are going to know beyond the shadow of a doubt when they see you, when they view your life, they're going to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you have had an experience. You don't just know a whole bunch of knowledge, but you've had an experience with the Father. Now let me read off. This has worked, but the fruit has been, here today, going to more, and not lasting. Sooner or later, when we're just seeking for healing, we need another healing down the road. When we're just seeking for finances, we need more finances down the road. But I'm talking about living out of a, di a dimension where things just happen naturally. We just naturally experience him. And listen, it becomes a perpetual experience. It is heaven on earth. Okay? Now listen. However, in realizing who he is in, through, and as us, and realizing the nothingness of sickness and poverty and sin and death because of what Jesus accomplished at the cross, it releases the perpetual experience of health and finances, and food, and clothing, and so forth. In realization, rather than seeking a manifestation, in realization we see that he is our health, he is our wealth, he is all that we have need of, and listen, as he is, so are we in this world. How is he this morning? Well, he's not sick, and he's not broke, and he's not depressed, and he's not all of those things that we all have experienced is none of that this morning. And we are one in him. Yeah. Now listen to this. In true realization, we do not have to receive anything. Well, oh, someone says, isn't there a time when we ask God for things? There's times that you ask God to lead you. You know, maybe there's a, a, a timing to certain things and certainly you ask him for the right timing. But how many know that Solomon, God told him, you can ask whatever you want. And he did not ask for one thing except wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And as a result, he was the richest man on the earth. Got him in a little trouble later on. But I'm just saying, he did not ask for anything other than wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. See, it was a perpetual thing. I believe there's a place that we can live out from when we live from the inside. Out. We do not have to ask for things. We just must realize we are the thing. I told someone recently, I said, you need a car? Realize you are the vehicle. <laughs> That's what Ezekiel said. He, Ezekiel saw a visible, viable vehicle in the earth that carried his glory, and it was a people. You need a house? You are the house of God. You are the tabernacle. You are the tent of God. So you see, when you have that realization, then it begins to be an experience out here in the tangible realm. So listen, we do not have to receive anything. Uh, there's many scriptures, you know, we have just read them cockeyed. We have read them so yeah. squirrely because our, our awareness was not one in him. But the scripture does not talk about you having, after the cross, having to receive anything. When you pray, believe you have already received and you yeah. shall have them. You shall experience them. So there's nothing even for us to change. And I'm talking about, listen, I'm not talking about babyhood. I'm not talking about young manhood. I'm talking about sonship. Yeah, sonship. I'm talking about sonship this morning. There is nothing to change. There is nothing to receive. But there's something to realize. Let me read on. In true realization, we do not have to receive anything but believe something. Yep. Say it again. In true realization, we don't have to receive anything but believe something. Realization does not try to change anything, but believes that it already is. James 1.17 says, with God, there is no shadow of turning, no bare by the no shadow of turning. Malachi said, I am the Lord who changes not. Uh, Hebrew says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. The kingdom that you and I have to do with this morning is an unchangeable kingdom. Yeah. It's an unchangeable kingdom. And 2014, I promise you, if you flow in this, it will yield a greater realization and you will begin to experience him in a way that you have never experienced him before. You, when you realize that 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse
verse 3 says we have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. Ephesians 1, 3 says he's given us all things that pertain to life, natural life, and godliness or spiritual life. We have it all this morning. And what we just simply need to come to the realization of is the isness of God. He is that right now on the inside. Oh, yes. You know, in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I began to meditate upon that a couple of weeks ago, and I began to realize that that faith, now you can use that scripture, but that faith there in Hebrews 11 and verse 1 was speaking of a faith that the heroes of faith had in that particular chapter, and the faith that they had looked forward to something in the future. Yes. But then when you go to the next chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, it says that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Yes. See, that's the faith of the Son of God. The faith of the Son of God. You know, I've heard people say, well, you know, there are a lot of promises in the New Testament. Can I tell you, after the cross of Calvary, there's no promise for us to look to. Oh, quiet in this church, church this morning. No promise whatsoever. You know why? Because, listen, now it is a statement of fact that he is yes. healing, health, everything. that we. He is that in us as us this morning. So you see, it is not faith that is looking forward to something. It is faith that realizes it's already completed, already done. Jesus made provision for every need, and not only did he make provision for every need that we might have, we are in possession of it because he placed it on the inside of us. You are totally unlimited this morning. We can live out of eternality right now. Yes. Right in the world we hear now. We can live out of infinity. We can live out of immortality. We can live out of the unlimited realm because he that abides on the inside of us is completely unlimited. No limit whatsoever with our Father. And where is He? He's closer than our breath, nearer than hands and feet. He's closer than we've ever realized. Yeah. And He is, right now, everything you have need of. And can I say it this way? And I know this isn't correct English, but also you is everything that you have need of this morning. You is. We, you is. we lack absolutely nothing whatsoever. Therefore, let me read on the post. Therefore... So we would say Hebrews 11, 1 is Old Testament faith, but Hebrews chapter 12, around verse 5, where he says he's the author of the finish of our faith, that's New Testament or New Covenant faith. Therefore, Hebrews 11 faith is looking forward to something that one will get, or listen, it is seeking for a manifestation, while Hebrews chapter 12 faith is realizing that it is done yeah. completely and totally. Ooh. That is the faith of the Son of God, which is a gift that has been placed within you. You'll never lack faith. You don't have a measure of faith. You have the measure of faith. It is the faith of the Son of God. Yes. Now let me say something else about prayer. When we pray, the highest form of prayer is seeing the end from the beginning. Yes. Let me give you several definitions of prayer. Prayer is not you going to God and saying, God, give me. Prayer is you quieting and listening to what he has to say to you. Well, True prayer is seeing the, seeing the end from the beginning. True prayer, let's say you have a friend or someone that needs healing, they need to experience healing in God. True prayer is not decreeing and binding and loosing and firing. Now, as I said, we did that in the past and it worked, but it did not yield fruit that remains. So I'm not criticizing that. There was a place for that, and we all experienced that. But what I'm talking about this morning is fruit that remains, not fruit that's here today and gone tomorrow. Not even fruit that's here maybe for five years from a healing we experienced, and then something else comes up in our body later on. I'm talking about perpetual, walking in perpetual health this morning. I'm talking about heaven on earth and heaven as earth this morning. So prayer is not us going to God to get something. You know, we go to uh, the Father and we say, you know, uh, this is what I need. In other words, prayer is not going to God for something, but true prayer is us realizing from something. Let me say that again. Prayer is not going to God for something, but it is believing from something that is already accomplished. Can I say this? And I know this sounds...
sounds very strong, but we need to relieve God of the obligation to give us anything. <laughs> hey, watch your filthy mouth. <laughs> we need to relieve God from the responsibility of giving us anything. How could he? He already has. He already has given us all things. We lack absolutely nothing this morning. And listen, we don't have to wait to the sweet by and by or after we die to experience that. We can experience it all in the love of the here and now. Yes. I say this to my church in Portland many times. Abram, how far can you see? Yes. However far you can see that you can experience. That's it. That's right. That we can experience yeah. in the love of the here and now. And remember, there's a whole groaning creation out there that is on tiptoe when translation says, looking for the manifestation of the sons of God, looking for a people that are bearing this fruit that remains. Yep. So, let me read on. In manifestation, we are seeking to make a sick body well, or change a state of poverty into prosperity. Instead, we must realize that we already are the healed. Yes. You are health personified this morning, because you're one with the Father who is health. Right? You are blessed. No matter what the outer situation, how many know to walk by faith and not by sight, is to disregard the outer situation and to realize I'm not defined by any pain I have in my body. I'm not defined by any lack of finances. I'm not defined by that. Neither are you. We are defined by the fact that he is health. Yes. He is prosperity. Yes. He is all infinite good. And you and I are all one with infinite good. Hallelujah. See, the scripture in Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first. Now, seek. One of the meanings of seek there is worship. We're not seeking him like we've got to find him out here. No. Worship. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, the, this is for sons, not babyhood or young men. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all of these things will be added, unfolded. Now, listen, I'm going to add a word, naturally. Yes, it will. And when it's unfolded and experienced naturally, then you're tapping into perpetuity. Yes. Something that is perpetual, not something that's here today and gone tomorrow. You're tapping into fruit that remains. Mm. Now listen to this. No matter what the situation looks like in the outer realm, we walk by faith and not by sight. Realization knows and acknowledges that Christ is my life. You know, in Colossians chapter 3, around verse 4, it says, When Christ, who is thy life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Who it is is in italics, meaning it's not there in the original. So what it's really saying is, when Christ, thy life, appears. Yes. See, he's just not in us. You know, years ago, several years ago, I began to look at the scriptures that talk about Christ in us. And I thought, well, where is he in my heart, in my liver, in my kidneys? Well, he, he's in there, but where is he? And I began to realize what that really should be saying is Christ in us as us. Yep. Christ in us as us. Now, I'm not saying you're God. I'm just saying you are Christ in the earth. That's what the New Testament, the New Covenant teaches. We are Christ in the earth. And as he is, so are we in this world. Whatever is true of him is true of us. We're an heir of God. Yes. We're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We've been given all things that we'll ever have need of. In fact, we are that this morning. Now listen to this. Seeking manifestation, and we've all done it. Seeking manifestation is saying that we still need something, and that we're trying to change something, but realization says we already be that which we used to seek. So again, our realization for 2014 is there's only God and nothing else. There's only God and nothing else. That means I disregard all of the negative pictures out there, and I walk by faith and not by sight. I live from the inside out. You know, Jesus did not live by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Amen. By shunning the evil and doing only what he considered to be right and good. He lived from the inside out. He lived by the Spirit. He said, I don't do anything but what I see my Father do. I don't say anything but what I hear my Father say. He lived by the Spirit. He lived from the inside out. Yeah. See, and that's the way we can live. Right. And as we live from the inside out and judge righteous judgment, what 
is that. Judge righteous judgment means I'm not giving any power to something out here that has no stinking power whatsoever. Jesus. Not giving any power. Nothing in and itself has any power except the power we give it. How do we give it power that has no power? By talking about it, by thinking about it, by focusing it upon it, by, you know, asking every time they can hear it, please pray for me. I don't know if I'm going to hold out to the end. I got a doctor's report that said I have six months to live. That's how we get power to something that Jesus Christ at the cross stripped the power from. And then we also give power to it many times by seeking to get a greater power, which is God's power, to overcome what we consider to be a lesser power. Yeah. Let me say that again. We give it power many times by seeking to get a greater power to overcome what we think is a lesser power. When that thing that we think is a lesser power has no power because Jesus stripped it of its power over 2,000 years ago. So we must learn to discern righteous judgment. Jesus said it this way, and also you'll find this in the Psalms and in the book of Isaiah. It says, we do not judge by the seeing of the eye or the hearing of the ear, but we judge righteous judgment. Amen. What is righteous judgment? It means that everything I'm tempted by, everything that appears to be coming against me, whether it's sin, sickness, death, poverty, whatever it is, if I judge righteous judgment, I'm going to look at that through what Jesus did to it at the cross of Calvary. It is death his burial, and his resurrection. That is what it means to judge righteous judgment. Jesus stripped the power from anything and everything that would try to bring us down. And nothing, therefore, has any power except the power we would give through our ignorance, through our fighting, mm -hmm. through our focusing on it, through our talking about it consistently. Yes. Our focus must be that we, he, in us, is whatever it is that we have need of. So our realization for 2014 is there is only God and nothing else. Can you see that now? There is only God and nothing else. Because that out there has no power whatsoever. See, there are so many people today that are Christian people, spirit-filled Christians, that are just having a heyday with our government, the worldly government out there, <laughs> criticizing the president, bad-mouthing, the cabinet, coming against all of the, you know, the gas prices and this and that and the other. You know what Isaiah was doing? He was doing the same thing in his day. Yeah. He was going around saying, woe this, woe that, woe the other, until a seraphim came, yeah. took a coal off of this which represents the cross, touched his lips, and the seraphim began to cry, holy, 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 the whole earth is full of the glory of God. That's the way we need to view our world today. Look past and through those things and simply say, the whole earth is full of the glory of God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, they that dwell therein are as well. See, that's walking by faith and not by sight. That's, it is. that's living from the inside out. So, what we must do is realize, walk in the realization, there is only God and nothing else. That has absolutely no power whatsoever other than the power I would give it. So our realization, there is only God and nothing else. Nothing has to change except between our ears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, we've already been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. What has to change? Nothing has to change except right here, the way we view way we view things. That's the thing that has to change. And thank God it's beginning to change. Now, Amen. one of the things that really messes people up is this. They believe that they only well, let me just say it this way. You're not half-baked this morning. <laughs> You're not half-baked. What do I mean by that? I simply mean you have been redeemed through and through. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 in the Amplified says we've been sanctified through and through. Now this is what a lot of people teach. They teach our spirit has been redeemed, our soul is being redeemed, and our body will be. Now that would be God sending Jesus to the cross of Calvary to only secure a part of our salvation and redemption. But we have been redeemed through and through, irregardless of 
whether we're experiencing it or not, we walk with faith, I'm at my side, remember? Irregardless of whether we're experiencing it or not, you are not half-baked. You have been redeemed spirit and soul and body. See, Romans chapter 8 talks about the redemption of the body, and it says, to wit, the redemption of the body. We're waiting, it says, to wit, the redemption of the body. And the two little words, to wit, means to know, to experience. So all I'm doing is, the only waiting in my life right now is waiting to experience the whole thing. I'm waiting on that. I'm waiting till my body finds out it was redeemed over 2,014 years yes. ago. That's the only thing we have to wait for is the realization. See, in some places the Bible sounds like, when you read it, it sounds like our spirit has been saved and our soul is being saved and our body will be saved. The only thing that is progressive in our redemption is us waking up to it. Yes. Us waking up to the realization that it is fully and completely finished and done. Now let me read on. Nothing has to change except between our ears, but something must be realized. The kingdom which we are, and you are the kingdom of God, is a changeless kingdom. It's a changeless kingdom. Many believe that it is only finished, as I just said, in our spirit, and so therefore they're seeking for manifestation in the soul realm or in the body. But they need to wake up to the realization that it's already done. Realization is Hebrews chapter 12 faith, and it is the faith of the Son of God. We must wake up. See, we do not have to. The main thing that has to take place within our lives is just simply wake up. Amen. Uh, I used the example. I, I did a message uh, some months ago that I entitled No White Poodle. Mm -hmm. And in this message, I gave the example if there was a hypnotist that came in the room and hypnotized one of you and then said to you, do you see that white po uh, poodle back there? I want you to chase it out of the room. And then before you got a chance to really chase it out of the room, he brings you out of that hypnotic trance or that hypnotic state and you look up there where he said there was a white poodle only to realize there is no white poodle. What happened? You woke up out of the trance. Yeah. And you realize yeah. there was no white poodle. Amen. And see, that's the way we must look at sin, sickness, death, and poverty, and all these uh, appearance realm negative things, and realize there ain't no white poodle. There is no such thing in my world as sin, sickness, death, and poverty. Oh, I may be experiencing some of that, but listen, it's only in the realm of appearance. And how many know the scripture says we are to abstain from all or ever What's the next word? Appearance. appearance of evil. Anything that appears to be evil or even appears to be good. Let me give you that example. Amen. See, there are a lot of things that religious people, they're real happy when they have an appearance of good. Amen. <laughs> See, the turn of the knowledge of good and evil, there are three words that are associated with it. Love, hate, and fear. <laughs> and religious people love a good appearance. Right. Doesn't matter if it's God, they love a good appearance. Yeah. See, I believe that the father of the prodigal had to look past a good appearance in the elder son. Amen. Because the elder son came and said, you never threw me a party. So, you know, he was a goody two-shoe son. And so the, the father had to look past that appearance of good. But in the prodigal, he had to look past the appearance of Amen. evil. Amen. See, so there are three words associated with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Love, hate, and fear. Now, let's say, for example, I walk in my backyard and I step on what I think is a snake. There's going to be some hate and fear there. <laughs> right? There's going to be some hate and fear there. But if I look down and I realize, oh, that's just my garden hose. <laughs> what happens to the hate and the fear? It's natural. Naturally, it's gone because I woke up to the fact that I didn't step on your snake. I stepped in my garden hose. See, that's what I'm talking about. It's just simply waking up to the realization that everything we think we have need of has already been provided, and it is who he is, and as he is, so are we. So you see, we're one with everything we have need of. Mm -hmm. Now, let me continue to read a little bit more. A little more of the difference between realization and seeking a manifestation. One of the problems, and this is a biggie, one of the problems, 
problems with seeking for a manifestation is that many do not realize that Christ is the health. Christ is whatever it is we think we have need of. And the important word there is Christ is all of that in us as us. Now that's the important word. <clears throat> that's the important word, as us. See, because what is said of him is said of us. So not only does healing abide in us and finances and all of that, it abides in us as us. We already are that. See, a lot of people think that supply is visible. It's my money. It's my food. It's my clothing. It's my house. It's my automobile. That isn't supply. Supply is invisible. Supply is invisible. Supply is, I've been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies already. <coughs> Supply is, he's given me all things that pertain to life and godliness already in me, through me, and as me. So once we come to grips or get gripped by the as part of this, then we're no longer separating. See, when we're seeking for a manifestation, and I, I hope you hear me by the Spirit clearly, I'm not saying that there was something wrong with seeking for a manifestation. It's just something we pass through. Hello. Mm -hmm. Many times when we saw a manifestation, we got what we saw it for, but it was not lasting. So when we come to the realization now that all of these things are true, they're truth in us, as us, we're no longer divine. Because when you're seeking for manifestation, if you can think of it this way, when you are seeking for manifestation, you are separating yourself from that thing you're seeking from, or seeking for. Say it again. When you are seeking for manifestation, you're saying, I need manifestation because I don't have that. And you hear that this morning. You're seeking for manifestation saying, I don't have that. But when you're seeking to walk in the realization, you're realizing, I is that. <laughs> I'm one with that. I am one with my infinite good this morning. And when we come to the realization that there's God and only God and nothing else, when we come, on a, when we wake up spiritually and come to the realization of our oneness in God, then we're no longer going to be seeking for manifestation because we don't need anything added to us. Now, the key is we need to come to the place. Have you ever seen a tree... In the springtime, wipe its brow <laughs> to bear fruit. And how many know you are depicted as trees? We're depicted as trees of righteousness. Right? That's what the Bible says. We are depicted as trees of righteousness. So we don't wipe our brow and try to produce fruit. In fact, we don't produce it anyhow. What brings forth the fruit on any tree is the life or the sap that's in the root yeah. system and comes up the trunk and out through the limbs or the branches, and then the branches just automatically, naturally bear it. That's it. Mm -hmm. So that's the way God has called yeah. us to live, to just naturally bear the fruit, mm. not struggling and fighting. And we've spent so many years decreeing and binding and loosing, and mm. God honored that. Thank God we got things. But it didn't last. It's not about decreeing. Do you know that the Old Testament is the only place you'll see that there was any decreeing? Yeah. Where kings are concerned? Mm -hmm. You find the word decree or decreeing one time, I think it's in the book of Acts, in the New Testament, and it has nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. What do we do? We rest in what he's finished and what mm -hmm. he's placed within us and who we be in him. We rest in that. And as we rest in that, then listen. Things begin to be naturally born in our lives. And when we bear those things naturally and experience those things naturally, not because we're trying to fight to gain something, when we bear them naturally, listen, they're lasting. Yeah, they are. Oh, they're lasting. When we just naturally bear those things as a result of resting in who he's already made us to be and who he is in us, as us where those things are concerned. It's not about fighting, folks. It's not about all of that that we used to do when we were in the dimension of the holy place realm. Not that there 
there was anything wrong with those. I want to make that clear. Nothing was wrong with that. It just was not lasting. I want to experience something that is lasting. Yeah. I want to experience him. I want to experience fruit <laughs> that remains. Hallelujah. That's what I want to experience. Yeah. And I know that there are a lot of born-again spiritual <clears throat> Christians today that have a lot of questions yeah, about why they would experience something for a little while only to find that it's gone and it's not an experience in their life any longer. So we need to understand the as part. As he is, so are we in this world. Now let me have you go. Do you have your Bible? Does anyone bring your Bible this morning? Let me read a couple of scriptures. I have to get at least one in here this morning. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, I believe it is, chapter 3. 2 Corinthians, chapter 3. And let me just kind of look at a couple of verses before I go to where I want to go. I quoted this already, but in 2 Corinthians, chapter 3 and verse 3, notice it says, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Now I could say it this way. You are the manifestation of Christ in the earth. Absolutely. And within Christ is all and everything. He is all. Nothing lacking. He is all in all this morning. And you are the manifestation of Christ in the earth. So you could say you are the manifestation of the allness of the Father this morning. Yeah. With no lack, no meditation. As I said earlier, you can live out of eternality. What does that mean? Just live from the inside out. Don't judge things by the way they appear or the way they look. Just live from the inside out. But then jump on down, if you would, to, uh, let's say, about uh, verse 14. Verse 14. Notice what it says here in verse 14. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away. Now, what this is talking about is the fact that G, the veil, how many know when Jesus died in his death, there was a veil between the holy place and the holy holies, yeah. and that veil was read from the top to the bottom. So that veil was done away with. There's no separation between us and the Father now. That veil was done away with. But now listen, it's now being taken away, notice where? Between our ears. In our consciousness or in our awareness, it is now as you hear the truth and wake up, that veil is being taken away fold by fold that is upon our mind or upon our awareness. Verse 15, But even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. People who are looking, you know, and studying the, the Old Testament, if they're not going there to see Christ, they yeah. have a veil. Yeah. See? Because, listen, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament, the New Covenant is the Old Testament revealed. So we should go there see him and his finished work. That's the only thing that we should read the Old Testament to see, is to see Christ pictured there. The Old Testament gives us prophetic pictures of the death, the burial, the resurrection. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give us the historical surroundings of the death, burial, resurrection. In Acts, they declared it. The epistles, Paul explained it and some of the others. Revelation gives us the product of the people that are walking into realization yeah. of this now and are experiencing it. Yeah. See, the book of Revelation is not about bugs as big as Volkswagens and scud missiles and all current events. The book of Revelation is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It's a very simple book to understand when you understand the symbolism there. Revelation is the decreation of what Adam created. It's yes, Passover, yeah. Pentecost, Tabernacles. It's the death, burial, resurrection, and the people experiencing that. But notice what he goes on to say, verse 15, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, in other words, if you go and you read the Old Testament, and you don't go there to see Christ, then the veil is still upon your heart. But look at verse 16. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord. Now, to me, fully and completely turning to the Lord is this. Our realization for 2014. There is only God and nothing else. Yes. Amen. Hello? There is only God and nothing else. Everything else that appears to have a power has been stripped of its power. It is a nothing, as I said, it's even a less than nothing. So to turn to the Lord is to only view Him, and when we see something other, see how that was filtered through the cross 
also Calvary. See it through the finished work of Calvary. Okay? Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. See, as we begin to see there's only God and nothing else, the veil that's on our awareness begins to be lifted from the fold. Verse 17, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty in every area of our life. That speaks to me of me experiencing my father naturally and perpetually. That's true liberty. That's true liberty. How many know that before you really acknowledged Christ as your Savior, you were bound? All you could do was sin. That's all you could do. But now that you've come to Christ, you have the liberty now to be obedient unto him. And what does it mean in the New Testament to be obedient? It means, number one, to hear. That's all it means. Obedience under the New Testament. The Old Testament obedience was if you did this, here's the consequences. If you don't do it, something else will happen to you. But New Testament obedience is hearing and understanding. Just having our awareness opened up. That's obedience in the New Testament. Now notice what it says again, verse 17. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Want to experience liberty? View. There is only God and nothing else. There is only God and nothing else. There is only God and nothing else. I'm not moved by these circumstances, these apparent circumstances in the realm of appearance. There is only God and nothing else. I choose to look at those things that try to break me down. I choose to look at them through the finished work of Calvary. And then verse 18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed. Now that was my point to get here. Changed where? Oh, redemption in the body. No, you have that. Redemption in the soul. No, you, you have that. Redemption in my spirit. No, I have that. So where is the change? The change takes place between our ears and our consciousness or in our awareness. That's where it takes place. And then notice what it goes on to say. We all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory. That's where I'm being changed. From glory to glory is the way I view things. And then it says, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So all of the change that we think we need, guess what? We only need it between us. We just need to wake up. We just need to wake up and quit giving power to something that has no power whatsoever. And when we realize that he is everything we have need of in us, as us already, we'll begin to experience him in a way that we have never experienced him before. John chapter 15 is the chapter where he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. I'm going to know it's the same line that flows through the trunk out to the branches of the limbs to produce the fruit. It's the same life. It's not another life. Someone says, I gave my life to the Lord. He doesn't want your life. <laughs> it's his life.
every one of us. And we will bear it for the remains. And the nations will come to us and say, men and brothers, what must we do to be saved? And we'll show them you don't have to do anything. You just have to know and understand that you already be it. Amen. Thank you, Father, for the crucifixion that was our crucifixion, the death that was our death, the burial that was our burial. Thank you for the quickening, the raising, and the seeding. Thank you for your love, your grace, for all that you've already done and placed within us. To your glory and to your honor. Thank you for this people this morning. Thank you for whole man salvation. That we don't have to wait to experience one aspect more of our salvation and redemption. But just simply to realize it's all here and it's who we are this morning. We bless you, we honor you, we thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said amen. amen. So be it. So be it. That's true of me. And that's true of you. Yes. Nothing for me. 